books to sell and I'm very happy to do a signed copy. I'm also doing a book signing tomorrow as well if, you, if any of you are coming back. So uh, I thought we'd just take a few key myths about HRT uh, and, and show how the landscape has changed over the last 20 to 30 years. So effectively busting the myths about uh, key things like breast cancer, bowel cancer, thrombosis, cardiovascular disease, all of which um, uh, one way and another have had quite a bad relationship, quite a negative relationship with HRT. And hopefully at the end of the uh, talk, you'll, you'll go home thinking you've learned a bit and, and hopefully that will be some positive feedback. So firstly, um, who, who am I? So my name is Anne Henderson. Um, I've been here all day with some of my team. I'm um, a consultant gynecologist um, and actually having done the rounds today, I think I'm actually quite a rare breed. Uh, I feel like I'm holding the flag up for gynecologists. Uh, we always get a bit of a bad rap, um, but it's mainly GPs who've been here today working in menopause. Uh, and in my clinic, we actually work with uh, uh, six uh, hand-picked GPs who are all fabulous. So I have a huge respect for GPs, but I feel that I have to hold the banner for, for consultants because uh, I think we do bring something extra to the table when we're treating patients. I've got 35 years of experience in gynaecology. Um, in my younger days, I also was an obstetrician, but I gave that up, thank God. Too much hard work, uh, too much litigation. Um, um, so I'm now a pure gynaecologist um, and menopause has always been my first love. I, uh, when I qualified, I qualified from Cambridge many, many years ago and I was very fortunate to have done uh, a, an, an extended postgraduate training with Professor John Studd, who some of you may have heard of, um, who is probably best known as the godfather of, of modern menopause. Sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago uh, and was still working literally almost up until his death. Um, and I think he did more to revolutionize menopause than any other uh, gynecologist or specialist I, I have known in my career. And women today and, and doctors like myself have a massive amount to thank him for because he was years ahead of the game. He was promoting the, the benefits of oestrogen long before everyone else cottoned on and he realized the negative impacts of progestogens again long before everyone else cottoned on um, and he was also an advocate for, for testosterone as well. So I did extensive postgraduate training in menopause, PMS, postnatal depression because there is a huge um, uh, uh, unification between those those uh, conditions. Many women go on to have one, then the other, and, and then finally menopausal depression. So uh, I was very fortunate to work with him. Um, I've run menopause clinics for the last three decades in the NHS uh, and then also in the private sector. And then for the last six years, I've been uh, purely involved privately and Six months ago, I opened my own clinic in Tunbridge Wells. That's called the Amara Clinic. Uh, and it's going from strength to strength. And it's been lovely to meet uh, women today, who, who some of whom have benefited from. We've actually had some patients here unexpectedly and many women who I hope we will be able to help. So I'm not just focused on menopause, although that's our main um, area. Um, because my background is in gynecology, we are offering a full service virtually every gynecological problem imaginable um, and the key difference is I'm working with several consultant colleagues so we offer a breast service at consultant level pelvic imaging and so on at consultant level um, and the idea is that women can have a one-stop service which I think is the is the gold standard um, and I mean you might say well you're in a very privileged position because you, you know you're running a private clinic you're not hide bound by the NHS constraints and I fully get that um, but I think at some point you have to put your money where your mouth is and if you keep banging on about what a service should look like you actually have to put it into practice um, and hopefully uh, the evidence uh, of the benefit will be there and uh, you know if we get the right conditions and the right funding then the NHS may be able to to follow suit so I very much believe in having everything under one roof, scanning, bloods, prescribing, 
appointments and then women can have confidence that if a problem arises they're not going to get sent on to see someone else um, so that's the first myth about HRT that there won't be any problems um, I mean that's nonsense um, there's no area of medicine where you'll you'll be without problems and the point is that you need to anticipate them side effects complications and you need to deal with them proactively and get things back on track uh, and I think that's probably where more expert menopause management such as someone like myself and many of the other doctors here will provide i think that's the difference um, we've seen every complication under the sun and we anticipate them and hopefully keep things back on track um, so without further ado we will go on to talk about breast cancer which is the it's always the elephant in the room um, and for many many years there have been papers from america from the UK, I think the most recent meta-analysis was in The Lancet in 2019, and it's always pretty negative. It's always, you know, HRT causes breast cancer. It's not what if, it's when, uh, and it's not the, the risk. It's fact there is a risk, um, and therefore it's, it's a bit of a black mark on, um, on taking HRT. Um, and actually, when you drill down and you look at the the fine details of many of the studies that have been done to date, um, the vast majority of them are significantly flawed. Um, and you might say, well, of course you would say that, wouldn't you? Because you, you know, you're a menopause specialist and they don't want to believe the, the bad press. But actually scientists, mathematicians, statisticians have literally unraveled many of the key uh, papers that were published in the early 2000s that we base our practice on today to some extent and they have been completely retracted in in journals in subsequent years um, because there were flaws in the sampling flaws in the outcome flaws throughout the studies um, but but as usual bad news travels fast um, and so the retractions never fully reset the balance from, from the original papers. Um, and the, you know, the widespread publicity didn't follow. So sadly, there are many doctors today who still believe the papers that were published in the 2000s. They believe that uh, HRT will universally cause breast cancer, and that is absolutely not the case. Um, so let's start with one example. So if you've had a hysterectomy, um, those of you who are on HRT, will know that women who have a uterus need progesterone. Those who don't have a uterus are just on estrogen. And you might think there's no difference between those two groups. And you couldn't be, you couldn't be more wrong because we have known for decades that women who just have estrogen, so women who've had a hysterectomy and they don't need progesterone, do not have an increased risk of breast cancer. Even the discredited American papers, the Women's Health Initiative paper, actually showed that. But that really positive piece of news got buried in the deluge of, of nonsense. Uh, and many, many other studies have confirmed that to date. Now, sadly, if, if I speak to an average colleague or a GP, and I ask them, do you know if there's a difference in, in the risk if someone's had a hysterectomy, they wouldn't know. And yet that is an absolutely key piece of information because a significant percentage of the UK population have had a hysterectomy. Um, at one point it was as high as, as one in five women. And these women do not have an increased risk. They could have HRT until they're 90 and there's no additional risk. And even more interesting, there are, are actually some small studies showing that they have potentially a reduced risk of breast cancer. So once you start to look at information like that, you realize that it's much more complex than simply saying, start HRT, it causes breast cancer. It's much more to do with the complexity of the hormones. So then we get on to the women who are on combined HRT, and these are the women who are also taking progesterone. And that's when it gets very, very, very interesting. So again, if you said to the average doctor, we're going to give Mrs. Bloggs, who has a uterus, she needs progesterone. Do you have a particular preference? Now, I do, um, but the average person prescribing HRT would probably say, no, I'll give whatever's available, because there's always shortages. 
if she's got a Myrena in, that'll do fine. Um, you know, and that's the wrong answer. Because again, all HRT is not equal. And if we look at the modern formulas, which are generally, it's what we call body identical HRT, and uh, not to be confused with compounded bioidentical, that's a talk for another day, but body identical HRT is the regulated current gold standard formulas, generally developed from soya or yam, so they're plant-based. Um, now, these formulas are a game changer. And if you take a woman with a uterus and you give her body identical oestrogen, which by definition is transdermal, so it goes through the skin, but you also give her body identical progesterone, she does not have an increased risk of breast cancer for the first five years of treatment. That's a long time. And beyond that, the studies suggest that the risk is as low as one extra case per thousand users per year, which is tiny. And there is no other HRT formula that will come close to that. And if you compare it to the synthetic progestogens, which have been around for years, which feature in virtually every single HRT study to date, they are the formulas that are, in, uh, that are associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. That's where we get the bad news from. That's where we get the out of date results from. So when somebody says to me, does HRT cause breast cancer? My answer would be, it depends. And if you're on an old fashioned formula with synthetic hormones, particularly the very androgenic progestogens, some of which are seen in contraceptive pills, and unfortunately in combined pit patches like Everell Sequi, Everell Conti, many of the, or or the oral tablets, they are quite aggressive synthetic androgenic progestogens. Even the Mirena that is commonly prescribed, all of these have independently been shown to be associated with an increased risk in breast cancer. So for anyone prescribing and for anybody taking HRT, you need to know what you're taking. It, they'll probably all work quite well, but you need to know what the risks are of the compound and the formula you're taking because nowadays HRT has become so sophisticated that the risks are very specific to the type of HRT you're on. And, you know, that, that is a massive myth that I would like to bust. And it's a myth that I see every day causing problems amongst medical colleagues, amongst patients. I'm constantly astonished when patients come to see, to my clinic to see myself and my colleagues for second, sometimes third, sometimes fourth opinions, because they've been round the houses. Um, and even though they may have seen other specialist doctors, they genuinely do not understand the importance of the hormones, particularly the nature of the progesterone they're taking. Um, which I think is very sad because the news is very positive. You know, if you've had a hysterectomy, it's positive news. Um, you know, people should not be telling you you're potentially at increased risk of breast cancer. Um, if you have a Mirena coiling, you might want to take it out and change to Utrogestam. But you can't make that decision unless the person who's prescribing has the knowledge to educate you and support you. And if you want to keep your coil in, you know, that's great. If you want to stay on a synthetic progestogen because it might control your bleeding a bit better, then that's great. But then you're making an informed choice. And the whole point about menopause management and what I try to get over in my book is it should be informed choice. It's not me telling somebody what they should have or their GP or Davina or Mariella or you know anybody here. It's about educating yourself and making your own decisions, but they should be based on science. And one of the things, uh, one of the areas we're really fortunate uh, with, with modern menopause is we have a wealth of scientific evidence. So the, 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 the figures that I've quoted you just now, I haven't just sort of plucked them from thin air. There are vast European studies with many thousands of women looking at these modern preparations. The, the progesterone that I mentioned is Utrogestan, so that's now considered to be the gold standard. Um, and you know, there's a wealth of evidence supporting it. Sadly, it's a victim of its own success and 
you can't get it now. It's, it's, it comes, it flies in and out of pharmacies all the time. And, you know, women are um, her horrifically, I, I, some of my patients were actually meeting in car parks late at night and swapping, swapping their patches and their sprays and, uh, and their Utrogestan to keep one another going. And I had to pretend I didn't, didn't hear that. Um, but uh, the good news is supplies will be back on track by the end of the year because the manufacturer has built a new com uh, factory and they're going to be churning out even more um, body identical progesterone. Um, the second myth, um, which again is equally important, is cardiovascular disease. So in simple terms, heart attacks and strokes. Now, it's a little known fact that the vast majority of all adults, men and women, will eventually drop down dead of cardiovascular disease. Um, it, most of the studies that have been done looking at women's health concerns show a result that women think they're going to die of cancer, and more specifically, they think they're going to die of breast cancer. But actually only 4% of women currently die of breast cancer, and that has been stable for, for some time. Um, 60% will die of cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, you do the maths. Um, so it's fascinating if we look at myth number two, because there's this constant fear that not only will HRT cause breast cancer, but actually it's going to cause cardiovascular disease as well. It doesn't get a very good press a lot of the time. Um, and again, completely wrong. Um, if you're on a transdermal estrogen, so that's a patch, a gel, or the spray, which is my favorite, Lenzetto, uh, that's a placebo. Um, the evidence is that if you take it for a sufficient amount of time, it actually reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. There are large-scale studies showing that if, if you take, let's say you start HRT around the menopause, age 50 or so, and you take it for 10 years to 60, approximate figures, um, your reduction in dying from heart attacks and strokes, primarily heart attacks, is up to 50%. Now, you know, I can see you looking and, 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 you know, when I lecture to healthcare practitioners, GPs and nurses and gynecologists, when I say that, they kind of, you know, there's a jaw drop. Um, um, and a couple of weeks ago, I was lecturing at the Royal College of Physicians to a breast cancer symposium. Um, and it was an audience full of breast surgeons and oncologists who, uh, as you can imagine, were not particularly receptive to HRT and I opened the meeting so it was uh, yeah uh, I needed a stiff drink after that but but actually um, we then went on to have a fantastic dialogue because these were erudite eminent physicians in their own field and they were all worried about breast cancer but we got that one to bed and then we talked about cardiovascular disease there was barely a single person in the audience of these expert consultants who had heard anything positive about cardiovascular disease they were still telling their patients you can't have hrt because it causes strokes it causes thrombosis it causes high blood pressure um, and of course women who have cancer are at increased many of them are at increased risk of those problems anyway particularly thrombosis so again we have another myth um, you have to give the estrogen transdermally. If you give it orally, that's a different story, and the risks are not dissimilar to the pill. And I, and I think that explains why we've got these myths. I think there's often misunderstanding that HRT is very like the pill, and the pill does carry an increased risk of high blood pressure and thrombosis, particularly the combined pill with, with estrogen. But the key difference is the pill is high dose, and once again, it's synthetic. Whereas the, the HRT that we're talking about nowadays is much lower dose, and generally it is natural or body identical. So you need to know the hormones you're on because the hormones will determine the risk. And if you're on a transdermal regime, there will not be any additional risk of high blood pressure or thrombosis, and even better, if you take the HRT for long enough, consistently, it will actually improve your longevity. Um, and the third myth is HRT will kill you at some point because you're bound to get breast cancer or a stroke or a heart attack. And again, if you look at longevity and you compare women who've been on long-term HRT or are still on it versus those who've never taken it, 
the death rates are down by 40% for each age match group. Now, that's an astonishing figure. I mean, there's nothing, as a doctor, you know, if I had to advise my patients on, you know, how should you improve your health? Well, you could stop smoking, cut back alcohol, lose weight, eat more healthfully, you know, fewer carbs, more protein. I think, you know, exercise more. I think if you did all of these things, you're not going to reduce your mortality rates by 40%. You, you make a you make a dent in them, but you're not going to reduce it by by that amount. Um, so again, it's a staggering figure. I'm not plucking it out of thin air. There's robust scientific data to show that. You might say, well, why why are these women living longer? And the two key areas are reduction in the cardiovascular deaths that we've talked about, and the second one, equally importantly, is the reduction in death rates from osteoporotic fractures. Um, so osteoporosis is, uh, we've known for decades that HRT is, is the number one recommended treatment for prevention and treatment. Um, and sadly, osteoporosis is, is a preventable disease, but if it isn't detected and it isn't treated, it can be fatal. Um, and as many as 40% of women who fall and topple and have a fra fractured hip will die before they even have a chance to have corrective surgery. Um, so although brittle bones in themselves are not necessarily fatal, the consequences of having brittle bones can be fatal. You have a fall, you fracture a major bone, you may not survive. So if you look at the, the improved survival from osteoporosis and the improved survival from cardio and reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease, you can see that that could easily add up to a 40% reduction. And another little known fact, if we take another cancer, uh, bowel cancer, um, women on long-term HRT have a reduction of up to 40% in the risk of bowel cancer, and that is creeping up the charts. It's not as common as breast, but it's, it's not far behind. And again, you know, I speak to my um, colorectal colleagues, um, you know, who generally don't know very much about HRT. Why would they? Uh, but if I say to them, did you know that? You see a lot of perimenopausal, menopausal women. Everybody's now having bowel screening. Many women come with gastrointestinal symptoms, which are due to menopause, but they're worried that they might have colitis or possibly even bowel cancer. So these, these doctors see a lot of women in the menopausal age group I did a straw poll, not a single one knew that there was a beneficial protection from HRT. So, you know, and we're not talking about jobbing GPs here, we're talking about surgeons who are, you know, years of experience, you think they might have a clue. Um, so you go, there you go. I mean, there's three major myths. We've got breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, bowel cancer, mortality rates, and if you ask many women in general, if you ask the general population, even doctors, they do, they do not know the facts. Um, and I think, I think it's very depressing because the news is generally very positive. Um, but there is a reason that we've got to this stage. I mean, you might be saying, well, goodness me, why on earth don't all these doctors know about this? And the point is that until very recently, there has not been any mandatory menopause education for doctors. Um, you know, generations of doctors have gone through medical school, even postgraduate training, um, and they might not have ever read a textbook that contains menopause advice. They may never have gone to a menopause clinic, and God knows they're few and far between in the NHS. They may never have been even in, sat in a clinic with somebody like myself. So you have to ask yourselves, how are they ever going to learn? I mean, many GPs actually, the first time they're faced with a menopause patient is when they're actually in a practice and they have, you know, some weeping wreck in front of them, um, desperate for, for, for um, treatment. And sadly, she's often given antidepressants because they don't know any better. So I think doctors are often criticized about the lack of knowledge, but we have to look at what's underlying and why it's got to this stage. And it's entirely the fault of the training organisations. My college, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, the College of GPs, and to some extent, you know, the, the training authorities, 
Um, menopause has never been prioritized. Um, and, you know, sadly it is now perhaps too little too late, but hopefully the new generations of doctors coming through will, will have a much better grounding. But as we all know, it takes a, a decade to properly train a fully qualified consultant or a GP. So we're not going to see this improved training um, for some time to come. So that's why I think meetings like this are wonderful because they're a way of getting the information like this direct to the public. Um, it kind of bypasses the medical system in a way, which you might say is, is sad, but you know, that is what it is. Um, so at least we now have the opportunity for members of the public to, to come and learn um, and then hopefully it will, it will um, stimulate your interest to, to educate yourselves more and we've got some wonderful resources available um, also online internet and so on and, and that's what I think is great I think it's fantastic that myth I get the opportunity to bust myths like this uh, at a meeting like this and uh, hopefully eventually the good news will, will continue to spread so um, I'm happy to take any questions do, do any of you have any burning questions yeah. I think I need to give you the... Thanks. Um, oh, it's loud. Um, would you recommend for somebody who was um, potentially starting out with looking at HRT, going to a doctor's, um, actually going in armed with information to provide them, like what you say, um, about the particular types of medication available um, because they might not otherwise have the knowledge. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's a very good idea. Um, and I think many people are doing that now anyway, perhaps without doing it consciously. Um, you know, I think, and, and even when people come to see me, they come armed with a huge raft of questions queries, I heard this from so-and-so and that from so-and-so. So I think it's just happening by default now. Um, I think, however, I, I, if I put myself in the shoes of a, of a GP with le much less knowledge than I have, I mean, I love that. I love having that dialogue because pretty much everything the patient asks me, I should know and I should be able to answer them. That's great. That's why they're coming to see me. But if you're a GP, you can imagine a GP who's a bit uncertain, who thinks, oh my God, you know, this patient probably knows more than I do. You can see the balance is, is flipped. So I would always say, uh, absolutely do that. But I think it's the way that you approach it that's very important. And um, I, I have heard from colleagues that some patients can be quite adversarial going, I want this, I want that, you know. and. It, it, you've got to work with your GP. You have to have a professional relationship. And a good GP will love the fact that the patient is educated and is bringing something to the table. That's great, that's what you want. You want an informed patient who's committed to try the treatment rather than somebody who's a bit, oh, I'm not sure. But it's all about the way that you, you, you build that relationship. Um, and if you've got a good GP who's empathetic, They'll love that, and I mean, unless you're asking them for something that's completely wacky, I'm sure they'll they'll be happy to to comply with it within the, the realms they can. And you know, again, GPs, testosterone, you know, we should all be having that talk. I'm not saying everybody should be on it, but we should be having that talk. But it's off license in the UK, so GPs are understandably wary about prescribing it. They haven't been trained. They don't know how to monitor the blood levels safely. And you certainly cannot just dish out testosterone without really rigorous blood testing. Um, and, and I think that's where I really begin to sympathize with them because they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. They think they may know that you would benefit from, say, testosterone, but can they do it? And can they do it safely within the remit of the NHS? And at the moment, I would say the answer is probably no. And, and you know, as I said, I work with several hand-picked GPs in my own clinic who have very big NHS practices and it's really informative to speak to them about how the difference the way they practice at the Amara versus how they can practice in the NHS um, and they, they have the same knowledge base in both clinics 
but they're constrained by the NHS because of the lack of resources, they can't do bloods, they can't prescribe testosterone. Uh, and that, that to me is a tragedy, you know? Um, I'm on, um, prescribed by a private um, doctor. Um, the your, what did you say the oestrogen was that you mentioned the body identical one? No, the beginning with you. Oh, the, the progesterone. Yeah, the oestrogel and testosterone um, gel. Um, and I was just wondering because it's the body identical one, um, why? they're still prescribing the other types of HRT if they've got a danger, they have a danger with breast cancer and etc. Why are they still being prescribed to people? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. So I don't think there's a single answer. Um, I think the first answer is that some doctors genuinely don't know the difference, uh, as I said at the beginning of my talk. So they're just prescribing because it's what they've always done and they don't really know the safety benefits of Utrogesta. Um, the second one is availability. Um, and I think that's a, a quite a weak excuse because for the most part you can get Utrogesta, but it does come and go in and out of stock and um, you know I have some patients who've been switched to a synthetic just because you can't get Utrogestam. But beyond that, um, I, I, there are very few, in my view, excuses. There may be an argument if somebody um, has had particularly excessive bleeding on Utrogestam to switch them to something else. And I would say if there's one weak point with Utrogestam, it's, it's, it is a very mild progesterone and so you're not going to get the degree of bleeding control that you would get with, say, a Mirena coil or with the synthetic progestins because they're stronger. But that doesn't mean they're, that they're better. It just means that they have, because they're stronger, they do have more risks, but they do control bleeding better. So for somebody where bleeding is not negotiable, and I have some patients who do not want to bleed, they're upfront about that, they love HRT, but they do not want to bleed ever, um, then for them, Utrogesta may work, but you may have to negotiate and they may say, well, I'd rather take something like the Mirena coil, although it's synthetic and it carries an additional risk, but it will control my bleeding better. And that's a compromise that I'm happy with. But again, that is your choice. And that's a dialogue you should be having with your doctor. They shouldn't be saying, have this without explaining why. Um, um, and there should always be this dialogue so you can pick what you think is the best option for you. Um, but if it was a level playing field, I think it should always be the safest form of treatment. The Hippocratic Oath first do no harm. So why would you ever prescribe something that carries an element of harm that is documented when there is a better alternative available? No, and that goes back to my first response. I think genuinely a lot of it is ignorance. Um, and yep, but uh, you know, you could argue if you're a GP, you have to keep up with diabetes and asthma and high blood pressure and epilepsy, and you know, uh, it's you know, it's very difficult very difficult so the way forward is for within a gp practice for some gps to become more specialized and that's already happening um, um you know it tends to be female gps nothing wrong in that but they then build more of a practice within a practice specializing in menopause that makes sense um but it, it doesn't happen everywhere and there are many gps struggling because they don't they really don't know what they're doing anybody else because uh, 2003 I had a fall in my spine and the same time I stopped having my I start my monopause and so I was asked by my GP to GP to um, send me to UCH hospital which I was given this HRT tablet 
My GP said, no, not to take it. The hospital doctor said, I have to take it. So I started it. They said to straighten my spine and also help me with my period because I want to have more children then. I stopped at the 40, age 40. So I started the medicine, but uh, 10 years after, they said my spine is still the same. And uh, when you are over 50, you can get uh, breast cancer or bloating stomach. So I asked the hospital doctor to stop it. After that, I had this bloating stomach for a long time before it go down a bit. But then I start having lump in my right arm that is very painful. But anytime it's painful, I start having pain in my right breast. They do tests last two years ago or a year ago, but they can't find it. In. They say maybe it's a breast tissue, but now it come back. The pain is terrible, but they say they can't find it. In. Maybe it's a breast tissue, so I don't know what to do. It's really disturbing me. Even though I stopped the uh, tab HRT tablet for a long time, so I don't know what to do now. If you have anything, any advice, please. Thank you. Yeah, so firstly, if you went back onto HRT nowadays, hopefully you wouldn't go back onto tablets because for all the reasons that I've explained, tablets are not by definition body identical because you can't give body identical hormones through the gut. It just gets destroyed with the stomach acid. So you were obviously on a combination that was synthetic that does carry a higher risk. Um, so probably not ideal. In terms of your spine, what you've just said is actually a very interesting point. So perhaps it's another myth that I should have brought up. Just because you're on HRT, it doesn't mean you're protected against osteoporosis. And you're obviously in that category. Um, and you might say, well, why? And it's a dose-related phenomenon. So HRT will only protect you against osteopenia and osteoporosis if it reaches a certain threshold in the bloodstream. Um, and the problem, sadly, in the past has been that many women were on ultra, ultra low doses of, of HRT because we were worried about the breast cancer aspect. And sadly, those women were still at risk of breast cancer because they were on a synthetic progestogen. And they were also at risk of osteoporosis because there wasn't enough estrogen in the tablet to protect them against osteoporosis. So it was a double whammy, quite tragic. Um, and that is another reason why I, I'm adamant that, um, and it probably didn't happen in your case, that if you're on HRT, you should have your levels monitored. I don't think it's negotiable. Um, I, I mean, I couldn't run my clinic for the most part without monitoring blood tests. Less important in perimenopausal women, but very important in postmenopausal women because you don't know if the hormone's being absorbed, you don't know if you've reached the threshold in the blood level to protect against all the things we've been talking about, um, and therefore you don't know if the dose is correct. So, symptom control is important, but it's not everything. And I've got women in my practice who've been on HRT for 15, 20 years, they should have bones like elephants. And sadly, some of them don't because, because of the formulas they've been on and the lack of monitoring, um, you know, and that, that's very sad. So the fact that you ended up with persistent osteoporosis was probably because you were under replaced and your doctor probably wanted you to come off because you were on a tablet formula, which as we've discussed, carries higher risk. But why they didn't offer you a, 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 you know, a body identical or a transdermal formula, I, I don't know. Um, and the current symptoms that you've got, it, it's not uncommon to have hormonal breast problems after menopause. Um, they often get blamed on HRT, but you're actually very interesting because you're the exact opposite. You're a lady, who has the problems, but you're not on HRT. So, you know, it just goes to show that you still get problems like that long, long after menopause, probably just unfortunate. Best treatment, high dose evening primrose oil, 2000 units a day, that's, that's what you need. Yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Have to go to the gym tonight. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick one. Um, is it ever too late to um, take HRT? Um, 
Is it ever too late to take the HRT? Is, that, is it ever too late? Is it ever too late to take the HRT? Um, well, I'm going to stick my neck on the line here. No, um, I, I started, I'll give you an example, uh, two weeks ago, I uh, started a patient who's 82, um, who admittedly had taken HRT until she was 70, um, and had amazing cardiovascular fitness, amazing bones, fit as a fiddle, and then her GP didn't want her to take it after that, so she had 12 years, she told me that there were 12 years of hell uh, and her husband came to the concert and he said, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I mean, obviously uh, it was her choice. Um, and uh, she went back on HRT, very low dose, very cautious. Uh, and we're just work working through the various doses. And within a month, you know, she said, I, I feel I'm 60 again. Um, so 82 is the new 60. Um, and it, it was, a, it was a you know, great consultation. Our husband was very supportive and he felt that, uh, you, you know, he could clearly see the difference in her well-being. And she was one of a group of women who, I mean, you might say, well, look, she's 82 for God's sake. Why has she still got menopausal symptoms? She wasn't coming along on a, a whim. This woman had between 14 to 20 episodes, vasomotor episodes during the day, each of which lasted up to five minutes. So you do the maths, and then she was walking between eight to 10 times at night. So she didn't have much of a life. Um, and you might say, well, look, it's ridiculous. She's 82, what, what's going on? But as many as 15 to 17%, so a significant percentage of the population are genetically programmed to have persistent vasomotor symptoms. Uh, that's another myth probably, that menopause symptoms go after a few years. Um, we don't fully understand what happens, but it's to do with the vasomotor reguli, the thermoregulatory center in the brain. And normally that resets after a maximum of about eight years after menopause. So if you go through menopause at 50, for the most part, by the time you get to your late 50s, most flushes and sweats have gone, even if you're not on HRT. That's, that's a general trend. But for this specific group of women, um, that never resets. So at 62 and 72 and 82 and 92, they will have exactly the same level of symptoms that they did in their 50s. Um, and, you know, it's pretty unpleasant. I mean, this particular woman, um, her mother lived to be about 100. So they're a very long lived family. And she said, uh, she always had a bit of sense of humor. Her mother said she was still having flushes and sweats when she went to her grave. And apparently they said at the funeral, they wouldn't need to, to cremate the coffin because the flush would do it, you know. And, you know, there's a bit of black humor there. But every woman in the family, virtually bar none, had this horrendous pattern, clearly a genetic inheritance. And the only solution for her was, was to go back on HRT. And I don't have an issue with that. She's making a valid choice. The treatment works. We can make the treatment safe. I, I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't see an argument against that. Um, um, and so in answer to your question, I don't think age is a barrier but it needs to be done properly and it needs to be done safely and it needs to be done with fully informed discussion so that the patient is on the right regime for the right age and and this lady's at 82 she's not going to be on the same regime she would have been at 52 obviously the, the dose is adjusted the bloods are monitored and she'll have a brilliant outcome i'm sure Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, really, really lovely listening to you. I think you've come across as one of the most, not, not saying anything against anybody else, one of the most genuine, sincere, humble professionals. Really, really enjoyed listening to you. I um, haven't heard about you, though. Where have you been? <laughs> I don't know anything about you, so it's a pleasure to, to get to know you today. Um, I read something recently that people, women think that, okay, you go on to HRT, whichever form, and it's sort of like overnight you're rejuvenated, but you're not. And is that the case for most women? Or, and, and how long does it sort of take to kind of normalize, so to speak? Thank you. So, yeah. Um, Great question. 
And actually, it's something that I say to patients before I get, they get the chance to ask me that question. So I would always wrap up my first consultation with a patient with a, with a word of warning, a word of caution. Um, I, I think there's too much hype about HRT at the moment. Um, don't believe all the hype. Um, you know, it slightly pains me to say that. I think there's huge positivity to take. Hopefully some of the things I've said today will, will make you feel quite happy about taking HRT. But I think there is a lot of hype. I think there's a lot of hype uh, about testosterone in particular. I think there's a lot of hype about levels, high levels, low levels, what should the levels be, you know. Um, and I think we're, we're in danger of uh, almost, uh, you know, getting embroiled in a, in a very potentially toxic discussion. Um, so the answer to your question is it's not a quick fix. And I would say, don't believe the hype. It, the, medicine is never a quick fix and HRT is not any different. Um, it's hard work getting a regime optimized, even in a clinic like mine, where we have everything at our disposal. I would always say to a patient, six months, that's what you're looking at. Four to six months. If you get there at four months, that's a bonus, but probably six months for everything to be pretty much optimized. And by that, I mean the estrogen, the estrogen levels, the dose, the product, the progesterone if you need it. And obviously if you've had a hysterectomy, you don't. And then the testosterone. Um, I mean, and maybe vaginal estrogen as well. So, you know, if you look at all the different complex hormones, you could have systemic hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. You might have local estrogen if you have urogenital syndrome. There's a lot of juggling there. Um, there's a lot that could go wrong and there's a lot that can go wrong and does go wrong. Um, you've got patient compliance, brain fog, you get your gels muddled, you get this muddled, you know. So I, I think realism is very important. And if somebody starts off on their menopause journey thinking, I think if I aim for six months, I'll be happy with that, then everybody's happy. Um, I always describe to patients that I think treating menopause with HRT is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I'm not really interested in how my patients are at six days, maybe even six weeks, but I'm very interested in how they are at six months, because I think six months is a barometer uh, of their long-term response. If you can get somebody feeling fabulous, 90% better than baseline, which is achievable for most women at six months, you've almost got them for life because they'll see the benefits, physical, emotional, cognitive, across the board, they'll be back on form and that's when you can build a long-term um, treatment program for the years ahead but if you rush it and you go for too high doses too quickly too many hormones chucking in testosterone immediately in my expert view it doesn't work patients get muddled the, the levels change too quickly and you don't get the the, the long-term outcome and the guidelines with testosterone, just to go back to testosterone, are very clear. The British Menopause Society guidelines are very clear. You should only be adding testosterone in once the other hormones have been optimized because it can blunt the impact of estrogen. It can be difficult to see what estrogen is actually doing if you're confounding it with testosterone. So although I think testosterone has a role to play, I think it has a measured role to play and we mustn't, we mustn't overuse it because it doesn't work for all women, and uh, uh, very clearly does not work for all women. I thought you were going to jump in. <laughs> here. Here. Um, thank you. How often should you be monitored? Because on the beginning of my HRT journey, I paid privately to go see someone because my GP was so unsympathetic. Um, but I've been on it for, I'd say, two years now. I have been back privately. Um, but how often should you be monitored? Because is it sort of one fix for all, or should you be... Um, so it was like one pump of the, on, on the Zento. So is it... Should I, if it was recommended at the very beginning of my journey, one pump... I've never been monitored 
Does, do you understand that? So how often should you be monitored? So the, there are not any national guidelines, so um, sadly, we probably do need them. Um, or I can just talk from, from what I do in my practice, and that's based on years of experience, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so my regime is baseline review, review at two months, with bloods if, if necessary, and not everybody needs bloods, but it can be important. Review at three months, so that's five months into treatment. Um, and then if somebody wants to go on to testosterone, they would have a further review after that to see if it works or doesn't work. They may come off it, they may stay on it. So usually by six to eight months, patients have had several reviews and they're stable. They're at that sweet spot. They then continue to be reviewed yearly, if there are no problems, so yearly would be 